Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. I had a great aunt who lived almost 100 years in a dilapidated and cold attic room in some squalid flats in Pimlico in London. And I remember visiting as a lad, this was in the 1960s, and noticing that my great aunt, her name was Fanny, great aunt Fanny, had no toilet. The residents of the block shared a loo in the basement. She had no bath. They still had public baths in London in those days. So she'd go down and take a bath once a week at the public baths. She had no kitchen. The residents shared a hob on a communal landing. And my maiden great aunt had no electricity. Her lamps were powered by gas. Yet when she died, my mother cleared out her place and found several hundreds of pounds in banknotes hidden in various places around the room, including under her mattress. And I recall that my mother was saddened by how much cash my aunt had stashed. And she often used to ask me, why didn't Aunt Fan use that money to get herself out of that awful hole? Well, it's a question that I've often thought about, and I think it should be explored in a book. And luckily for us, breakthrough author Moira Kendall has done that. She's explored that question in her debut fiction, The Spinster's Fortune. Hello. Hi, Wonderful. how are you doing? Very good, you? How are you? Good, good to see you. Oh, it's lovely to see you too as well, Mary. Um, I was just um, explaining to the uh, listeners that I had a great aunt who lived to almost 100 years old, 99 she was, when she uh -huh. died. And she lived in an old dilapidated attic room in some very squalid flats here in Pimlico, London. She lived all of her life alone in one room. Yet when she died, my mother cleared out her place and found several hundreds of pounds in banknotes hidden in various places ah. around the room. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. And the amount of cash was equivalent to actually buying a house. And I remember call my mother was very saddened by this. Yeah. And how much cash had been stashed over the years. And she kept yeah. asking me the same question. Why didn't Aunt Fanny, which is her name, use that money to get us out, out of that hole? Yeah. That's a question I often thought should have been explored and maybe explored in a book. And I'm really pleased that you, Mary, yeah. have kind and of you know, done that. It's actually a story that I have come across other places as well. Uh -huh. I, have, I have seen that go on. I, I don't know if it's a female thing that maybe females do this more than men. But yeah, I, I, uh, I had an aunt who, after she passed, she had hidden cash in empty jewelry boxes. So like underneath where the rings are and everything. Yeah, yeah. And the my my cousin's uh, little girl happened to be playing with the jewelry boxes, the empty jewelry boxes, and yeah. found all this cash. Yeah, same kind of thing. Same yeah, kind it's of interesting. Thing. interesting. Maybe it's a, a a thing which would is a maternal type idea, even though my great aunt was a maiden aunt. In as much as maybe you keep stashes like other wild animals do, stashes of I suppose they uh -huh. would keep food. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Part of our um, evolution is that we would keep things which will keep us alive in the future. Yeah, yeah. And I don't realise how much of, is building up. Possibly. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So you live in uh, Maryland, is that right? I do. Yeah. yeah. And is that an area which is like steeped in ghost lore and mysticism and magic and mythology? Because I always try to, because I'm interested in fantasy uh, structures and why yeah. we depend so much on fantasy, um, especially to get us through difficult times. Um, how much fantasy um, relates to our the world that we actually live in. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, and I'll give you an example. I was looking on your um, blog, and I noticed that you went past a standing stone, like a magical standing stone. Well, I would call it a standing stone. Right. So we've right. got these stones all over, littered all over England, which were right. put up by druids. It looks like that. So yeah, is that right. the kind of thing that would inspire you? So Maryland is not known <laughs> for stones circle rings unfortunately okay but that said i think we do have our fair share 
of haunted places and yeah. ghostly happenings tied yeah. into historical events, such as, for instance, the American Civil War was a yeah. biggie over here. And also, as somebody like yourself, drawn to that kind of thing, I kind of feel like if you have that bend, it's going to find you or you're going to find uh. it wherever you might find yourself. Yeah. I, I really feel that. And along with that, for me personally, I'm, uh, according to my DNA information, about 100% Celt. So, oh, you. Uh, <laughs> so you go back to Druids then. Exactly. I've got that Celt vein running through me and even a little bit of Celtic Sixth Sense at times. Ah. So yeah, that, that's where I'm coming from. So oh, wow. well, that makes sense. Out. That makes yeah. sense. And have you ever visited Kendall? So your pen, I don't know if it's your pen name, I'm pretty sure it is. It, have, is Kendall K-E-N-D-A-L-L, -L, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And have you ever visited Kendall in Cumbria? It's in the Lake District, and it's pretty an amazing place, actually. It's got castles and a Roman fort and an interesting industrial heritage because it was the centre of the snuff production in England. And they've even got their own language, Kendalian. Have you ever been I, there? It, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> and unfortunately, I've never had the opportunity to travel to that part of England. Oh, okay. Uh, I would love to be there. It's too bad we're not sitting up there right now having this podcast in a pub, right? It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Looking out over the mall. <laughs> right. Um, no, I haven't, but um, sounds great. So the story, though, behind my name, mm. b behind my pen name, is actually, I chose that pen name uh, at the time that I got the book contract. And the reason I decided I had to have a pen name is because my name, Mary Lavin, is also the name of a famous Irish novelist from the 20th century. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, she was based in Dublin. Yeah, I kind so, of uh, I recognize her name as a kind of poet and she had a lot of imagination. She was quite she well did. known. Yeah, And I think she's known most for her short stories. I yes. Think. I think she's written novels as well. Anyway, imposter syndrome being tough enough as <laughs> exactly. it is, I decided, oh, I'm not going to do that to myself. Right. So I needed to come up with a name. So Mary Kendall is actually my original first name and middle name. Right. And also, it is the same middle name as my father and my grandfather. Right. And that's going to circle us right back to the spinster's fortune when we talk about the origins of that. Yeah. And I'll just leave that there for now. Okay, that's a good place to leave it, and mysterious enough. Uh -huh. So tell us about your path into authorship, because I've read that it was circular, or this is how you describe it anyway, mm -hmm. circular rather than linear. So I would yes. be interested to know what trade-offs there were perhaps on that path, especially the path towards publication. I think other listeners might be interested to hear about your experiences. Okay, so yeah, at this point, I wouldn't even call it circular. <laughs> I, would call, I would call it, after now that I've had about a year to reflect on it, I would call it a zigzag path. Yeah. And by that, I mean, when I headed out on um, getting published, I soon realized you've got to take the detours, the bypasses, the workarounds to eventually get to the point of, of that publication. And, and that's okay, I think. And I guess along with that is what I discovered is it, nobody's going to hand you a playbook with a step one, two, three, here's how you get there. That, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna need to find, you're, need, you're gonna need to come up with your own playbook. And so I think that has been my experience. And what I would say to your, to your listeners is, you know, realize creating your own path is okay. And maybe even better yeah. than just a linear path. I totally agree. I mean, there's no way that uh, Jane Austen or the Bronte girls, you know, Went, out, went down to the library and got a book, How to Write a Novel, <laughs> 101, did they? Yeah. yeah. And yet they happened. wrote you know, uh, things of great artistic merit. Mm -hmm. But what was inside you that, was, was there this bursting flame inside you that said, I have to write a novel? So uh, first and foremost, I'm a reader. Okay, Reading, yeah, yeah. when I became a reader, that just rocked my world you yeah. know, at a young age. And then t to me, I feel that for a lot of people, writing just becomes a natural extension of having a love of reading. And I think that's the case for me. Yeah. And then along with that is, I also feel that everybody has creativity. And, oh, and, 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 it's, and the way you, you express that creativity is gonna be individual to, to what works for you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And for me, it's writing. Writing, it, I feel, is how, I, how I'm able to tap into creativity. And I feel it's really important to, to keep that cre creativity flowing and to tap into it. Well, please, that's a very optimistic view that everybody is, has creativity. It's <laughs> slightly different to my own view. I, I, well, I think even the people there. that we look at and think, oh, they don't <laughs> have a creative bone in their body, yeah. I would even say they do. Mm. I would even say they do. It's right, just very, very nice yeah, of you to say that. I mean, so what books, kind of books were you reading then? As a child, I yeah. started out uh, pretty early on into the Gothic, the Gothic romances, the Gothic mysteries. Oh, yeah. And then as I went along, um, that, that, that was really kind of my um, wheelhouse, I would say. That was what I was drawn to. Yeah. You know, yeah. Stories that just intrigue and, and, and just a love of storytelling. And then I moved on and, and um, when I went to college, I was able to take a couple classes. Southern, I don't know if you're familiar with Southern Gothic fiction oh, yeah. as a genre. Yeah. And that's yeah. completely absorbing. And that was something I was exposed to later. Um, you know, Flannery O'Connor and writers like that. And yeah. so, you know, along the way, you just kind of get building blocks that eventually lead you to where you are in your writing. Yeah. And what's going to inform your writing. Yeah. So you went to college. Did you study literature? So it's funny. I always thought, always from a young age, that I would be an English major. In the U.S., we call it an English major. And so I started out that way. and And then... I uh, had, there was a program at my college called Historic Preservation, uh -huh. which might sound kind of funny to you coming from England because we're such a new country over here, but Historic Preservation was a movement in the U.S. to preserve what we do have. Yeah. And um, I, I thought, oh, that's, that's pretty neat. I'll take a couple classes in that. Well, what ended up happening is the English major fell to the wayside and, yeah. and my career um, became a um, career in history, and I was a historian. I was an architectural historian at one point, oh, and right. steeped in research as well. Yeah, so that meant that you would have to write um, pieces. Yeah, you know, you'd have to write assignments and theses, I suppose. So um, that exactly. was, I suppose, when you started to um, write using a little bit of intellect and academic uh, discipline, perhaps. Yeah. And, you know, to me, history goes hand in hand with writing novel. I mean, history, it, or that's stories. Yeah, exactly. What we're talking about. And so when you're, when you're really immersed in history and digging through the research, you're finding nuggets. You're finding stories. And the best job I ever had, I was an architectural historian out in the countryside of Maryland. And my job was to get in the car, and I had a map of where there were buildings 50 years and older. And I had to go out in a kind of mountainous area, country area, and find these buildings. And sometimes it meant driving down long deserted driveways to run down ramshackle houses and knocking on the door and seeing who was gonna be there. And I won't get too deep into it, but let me tell you, that's some fuel for the imagination. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, a lot. Well, so those kind of mansions were built in what kind of period? So that was post um so and it, it, so the the, the um, guideline in the US is anything 50 years or older oh, right can be considered historic wow you know and in part it's because we have such you know amazing development over here of the land yeah and it just gets carved up and and history gets lost very easily so this historic preservation movement started over here to try to pin down that that yeah. happening so that we had something some vestiges left of yeah. our culture and of our history you know? good well, i'm glad about that um you know you I've, I've been to las vegas a few times and i always remember when i first went um frank sinatra's place was still um standing start uh, stardust casino of course yeah. <laughs> went there a couple of years later it had gone you know i was thinking i know well, i know i mean luckily they keep a lot of the stuff uh it used to be at thunderbird there used to be a place where they keep some of the um yeah at, le at least the lights and some of the old machines or whatever right, just right. some kind of memory i know and then did you, do you remember seeing, I forget the name of it, but Bugsy Malone's, um, yeah. but his, they kept like just a piece of it, yeah. of the front facade, and then they built the rest of it on top of a little piece of facade. <laughs> but yeah, that's, it's a trade-off. That's, that's kind of how they do it. Yeah. And, you know, the idea is something's better than nothing, I guess. I suppose, yeah. To keep the history, yeah. So you established yourself as a writer. When was that? 
so the novel was published in April of 2021. Right. And so, but I've been writing for a lot of years. So what, so was there a sort of catalyst for you going into publication then? I had a bunch of projects that were sitting dusty on the shelf. Yeah. Is what it was. And so I would work one and try to get it out there in the world. If it didn't work out, I would move on to the next. Yeah. And that was actually the case with The Spinster's Fortune. The Spinster's Fortune is not the novel that I thought would be the one. Okay. That would end up getting me getting me published. But as to, you know, that zigzag path, that's how it turned out. So let's go down the zigzag path a bit. Um okay. so some of these other novels, what happened to them? So uh the, there's there's all still on the shelf. <laughs> oh, there right. was a project I was actively querying when the spinster I had given up on the spinsters pretty much. Yeah. It was back on the shelf. I was just doing one. I queried it for a year, a little over a year. Yeah. And I queried over 102 times. Wow. Nothing. I mean some nibbles, but but didn't lead to anything. Yeah. So then I moved on to my next. And in December 2020, I was actively querying my next project. Right. But I had sent out onesie twosies here when I saw something come up that might be a match for the spinsters. Yeah. And luck, lady luck, uh, fell into my lap and my publisher decided that spinsters was something they wanted as a project. And then there you go. You know, the rest of the story. So people might ask, I will. So I'm going to ask on their behalf, why didn't you consider self-publication? I guess I really, I was at a point with my writing that I really felt like I needed the validation from somebody okay. else. Yeah. And, you know, writing alone in a room without any recognition or attention can start to feel a little bit like if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody ever hear it? Yeah. And so I really wanted to move beyond that if it was at all possible. Yeah. And I've, and I've all, as well as a, as the Celtic gene, I've also got the stubborn gene. So I wasn't giving up and I was going to keep trying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, don't blame me for that. But um, <laughs> people might be thinking about uh, the possibility of going to independent because once you start becoming an independent uh, author, then you do start to collect other people in your sphere. <laughs> you know, people will come and help you in, through yeah. social networks. And th right, right. and I go out to, like most of uh, independent authors, we go out to a lot of conferences. We do a whole load of presentations at places. You know, and you start snowballing, so yeah. you're not on your own, you know. Right, I know. But I, I also was at a point where I knew nothing yeah, about uh, the business course. end at yeah. all. Yeah. And I really felt I needed a little bit of hand holding with that. Yeah. Now, a year later, I know much more. Yeah. And I think now I'm at a point where I would feel a lot more comfortable yeah. pursuing independent. But where I started, I don't think I was in any, any uh, place to take it on by myself. Yeah. No, okay. That makes sense. Well, we might talk about that a little bit more in, in a little bit later on, but let's okay. talk more about the Spinster's Fortune. So it's, it's been described as a moonlight gothic fantasy um and it's got gothic undertones and lots of darkness and we know that you've been influenced by that uh, in the past when you've been a reader so but what led you to write a historical fiction and with gloomy atmospherics okay so first of all i'm going to say moonlight gothic fiction <laughs> i love that <laughs> that draws me right in. just that phrase yeah sucks me right in and i think right there says why I write what I do. That aesthetic, that vibe is just, I love it. I love it. Give me more. So I think that's why I became a writer of that ilk. Now, along with that, Spinster's Fortune specifically, so I had, I had put a project aside that was totally not gothic -y and not that vibe at all. It was a contemporary uh, buddy road trip novel. Okay. And it hadn't panned out. Put it back on the shelf. And I had just read, in my own personal reading, a book that was considered a literary mystery. And I thought that was so cool. The book was really good. I thought the concept was so cool. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know what? I, I think I want to experiment with that. I think I want to write that. 
but then I needed the inspiration. Like, what, what was I going to write about? Well, at the time, I was doing some uh, research in historic newspapers. I was researching uh, my grandfather, who has the middle name Kendall, who was had a presence in the newspaper because he was a lawyer in D.C. in the 1920s and the 1930s, and he worked on some famous cases. So there were newspaper articles that were popping up about him. Yeah. So I drilled down and kept digging, and a photograph popped up of him, which is, you know, that's, 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 nice. that's gold yeah. in, in genealogy land. And so I was so delighted to get this photograph of him because I really didn't have any, any um, photographs of him at, this age, at the age he was in his early 30s. And it was so neat, and I'm delighted. And then I saw the article that went with the photograph, and that was the jaw-dropping moment of finding out about the real life Blanche McGregor, the real life spinsters yeah. fortune. And I was like, okay, light bulb moment, literary mystery as a genre and this inspiration connect them. And there you go. That's how it came about. So one of those houses you once visited, was that kind of backdrop or did you have, uh, was it completely out of your imagination? What the house would look like okay so the house the, you mean the real life house that i then depict in the novel well i suppose you, there's, there's two bits isn't there i suppose as a historian you'd be thinking where was that house like if if i was been doing the history of that i'd go and try and find the house <laughs> right but also there must be a fictional side of it and that is how would you like to portray that house yes exactly so you know the old adage write what you know uh-huh it's funny i was never a really big person big fan of that like okay do you really have to do that but the, the fact of the matter is this is an area where i grew up i was born in dc i went to high school in dc my father's from dc and the neighborhood of georgetown which is the setting of the novel oh, yeah. and the real life place of yeah. the house is very well known so it was not hard to imagine it and conjure it up at all for me and yeah, now that you're saying it, it's funny, I never really thought about it, but all the time I did spend um, researching historic houses elsewhere, mm -hmm. definitely, I'm sure, uh, allowed me to to get right in there and, and depict it in the way I saw it in my mind. And then um, in real life, well, the, the real life story is the house had to be demolished because it was in such bad shape. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that happened in real life, which means that the actual house is no longer there on the street. Yeah. Um, but Georgetown as a neighborhood is enough intact that the majority of the houses, the original houses are still there and that there's enough models to take. Yeah. Out. So Blanche Magruder, is that how you say her name? Yes. Magruder. So she hid her money in this dilapidated <laughs> mansion. Yeah. And yeah. I suppose then uh, you developed a uh, mystery, a mystery story then. Exactly. So, uh, and, yeah, like a murder yeah. mystery, except instead of trying to find the murder, I don't want to go too deep into the plot, but they're right. trying to find the money, I, I suppose, are they? Or the treasure? Yes, that's right. Yeah. The, first, the first part of the mystery is the, well, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. There's an element of mistaken identity right from the beginning. She disguised her identity. And again, we don't want to give too much away of the plot, no. but th there's an element of that. That's that's part of the mystery, figuring yeah. that out. And then there was money is hitting his hidden, how much, where, and then there's the why. Yeah. Why did she do it? Yeah. And when I started reading the real life accounts of the story, that's that was the, the really the thing that stuck out the most in my mind. Why did she do that? What was her motivation? Yeah. Why did she do that? And I felt that there was a mystery that stemmed out of all of it. Yeah. If you were asked what the theme of this story is, what would you think the theme is? So I did not concentrate on a theme, but <laughs> yeah. I think what has emerged since the story has been published is the theme, believe it or not, of family. Yeah. And family connections and sibling relationships. Yeah. It showed up on the Amazon chart as sister fiction, for instance. So that seems to have been the overarching theme. Yeah. Have you got a sister? 
I do. I have two sisters. Yeah. Like, are they older than you or younger? No, I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. I'm the oldest. Are you yeah, in good good company with them, as Jane Austen might say? Uh, fortunately, yes. Good. Because, as, as we all know, a lot of sibling relationships can just be fraught with tension and problems. Yeah. But so far, so good. Knock on wood. Never say, you know. You, you and do they live nearby? Do they live in Washington or... Uh, I, yes, we all live in the same area. We stayed in the so same what area. do they think of the book? So uh, my one sister really helped me as, as a first reader. She is an English major. Oh, that's um, good. She went to college. She was an English major. So she's, she's very sharp, and she was able to be an excellent beta reader for me. Yeah. And she's been a great support. My other sister, I don't think she's read it yet. Okay. But she's supportive in her way, I guess you could say. Well, that's good. It must have been reasonably, I'm not saying for a second it's easy for you, but it probably was slightly uh, more practical to be able to uh, get the period setting right, I guess, because you are a historian. You know, so you're used to know, knowing what to look for. Am I right on that? I think so. Yeah. And going into it, I, kn I knew, and I, I think most of us know, historical fiction readers really want the details to be right yeah and if those details are not right there's going to be rumblings yeah, yeah. and i knew this going in because i also read historical fiction that's a genre i read and, and, and i enjoy so i did really want to make sure that the details were right and i took a fine tooth comb through it afterwards and really tried to pin down everything uh an example that i found yeah was there was a cab involved at one, a taxi cab involved at one point. Yeah. And I, in the U.S., we have yellow cab. I don't yeah. know if you, you probably don't have that in England. Anyway, yellow cab is a common cab. Yeah. So I had used a yellow cab, not thinking really about it. And yeah. I went, oh, wait a minute. Check it. Do I need to check that? Yeah. And so the story, it takes place 19, in 1929. Yellow cabs were around, but not in D.C. till 1931. No. There you are. This is a side note, but I really love using setting as character. I love to write that. And I also love to read that. Mm -hmm. So setting as character, I feel, I hope, uh, is conveyed in this novel mm -hmm. because that's, that's really like a thing that, that I'm drawn to. So when was the house built? The, the real life row house? Oh, no, the one in your fiction. In, in the in the novel yeah it was around 1850s 1860s where was the land where did the land come from so the land was a uh, city lot in the yeah. neighborhood of georgetown and so what happened is as the as the georgetown neighborhood was constructed lots were were sold off and in yeah. the story i have fictionalized that the lot was a considered a subpar lot and Blanche's father walked by one day and needed to get a bigger house for his growing family yeah. and made a deal for the lot and then had the had the well we call them row houses or townhouses oh yeah 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 how they fit in together so yeah side. exactly yeah I love it. the lot was odd so I had it as a single standing house yeah which ties into the story in terms of some of the description. That's good. So would you describe it, because it has been described in Amazon as a relaxing mystery. Would, are you happy with that characterization, a relaxing mystery? So here is what I've discovered now that the book is out there in the world. Yeah. I've discovered and learned something I never knew. When a reader picks up a book, it's going to be their own experience yeah it's not going to be my experience anymore at all that's right they're bringing to that book themselves and everything with them that's right and it's going to be their experience what that means is a relaxing mystery to one person could mean a on the edge of my seat stayed up all night suspenseful experience to somebody else and indeed I've heard it described that way. I've heard yeah. this described that way by others. So by saying all that, what I mean is I love whatever the experience is for somebody. I really do. I'll take relaxing mystery. I'll take edge of my seat. 
whatever it is. Along with that, another example of that is recently, just recently, I got a review in that the person did, there's a, there's a subplot involving sisters and sister relationships. Yeah. yeah. And the person did not like the sister subplot. They felt it didn't add anything to the novel and they felt that, that the novel would be better off without it. By contrast, I've gotten a number of reviews over the past year that the sister's relationship brought somebody to tears, was meaningful, and made them think about their own relationship with their sister. Yeah. What do you do with that? You know, I think, I think it just shows you how the experience is going to be different for everybody else and how yeah, we yeah. step back as writers and let them have at it. Yeah, I like the idea of stepping back and looking because if you go to a picture gallery, you know, like uh, in this country, you've got the Tate Gallery, you'd go to uh, look at a famous painting. When you go and look at that painting, which is obviously um, an idea that the artist has had, you obviously see that painting through your own layers. Once as a, a, an artist, because that's what I, th I think we don't say enough, we, uh, our authors are artists. Once the artist allows their um, creation to fly free, then it's not, no longer your responsibility to look at it. <laughs> exactly. It's, at, it's out in the world doing yeah. its own thing. We expressed our creativity yeah. as creatives. Yeah. 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 And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it has got suspense and I suppose it's, romantic because that's um, an integral part of gothicism mm -hmm. but it's free from profanity and sex scenes and violence so how easy or how difficult was it to write it um, you know in now because <laughs> it's only written a couple of years ago isn't it really or completed a couple of years right. ago how was it how difficult is it to write in this day and age without you know profanity and without sex and without you know some of the vulgarness that is quite commonly accepted in my, virtually all fiction now right so like i said i started out writing it with the specific intention that i was going to be writing a literary mystery right yeah yeah and because of that right away i brought a set tone dialogue and style of i would call formality yeah to the writing and that dictated what the story was going to be. And what that meant was that kind of story was not going to have the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It just, <laughs> it just wasn't. It, you know, the story was not going to go there. Uh, so that's how it ended up like that, I think. Now, I don't think I necessarily achieved the literary mystery uh, status but the formality of that, I think I did achieve. And I think I did that. I, that did stay with the novel, in my opinion. Are you wanting to write something which is a bit more sexy or a bit more gory or a bit more rude? Is that something, is that, the, you know, is that a compulsion you'd like to scratch? So I think as a writer, Neil, you, you probably agree with me. When you're writing, sometimes these characters have a mind of their own and yeah, they, they just do. take off and do something that you never even thought about. Yeah. And so I would say that if the story goes there, absolutely. But it's going to be where the story goes and what kind of story it is, I think, that would involve those elements if those elements need to be there. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally open to that. So there's people who call themselves pantsers. Have you come across that phrase before? Yes. Yeah, where you create a, a character which is so strong that it can take you on the journey. That mm -hmm. character takes you on the journey. Mm -hmm. um, but other people are very, very, very careful and meticulous plotters, and they have a huge plot. Now, you must have had an idea of the beginning, middle, and end, because it's kind of based on uh, truth. But obviously, mm -hmm. you're adding the garnish, if you like. But would you consider yourself to be uh, a plotter? Was this meticulously plotted out, or did you allow those characters to uh, take you on by the hand? 100% pantser. Oh, right, good. Right here, this girl, pantser. Uh, I know that about myself. Now, what I, do, what I do do with projects, I usually have the idea of point A to point B. Yeah. So getting there is, is the pantser thing. And so far, so good. I think the, I mean, I definitely see the benefits of being a plotter. 
I definitely see that. Yeah. But, and I, and I think the potential downfall of being a pantser is sometimes you get really in the mud and you have to go back and edit and dig yourself out and fix a lot. Yeah. Maybe that you wouldn't if you were a plotter, but that's where I am right now as a writer, I think. Yeah. And how many words, what was the word count for that project? For the Spencer's Fortune? Yeah. It's around 66,000. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And so how consider it a shorter novel, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a novel. How, how long do you think it took altogether if that was a, oh, a project? Actually, you had you have the, the, I have the timeline. Do you want me to share it with you? Well, yeah, just a basic okay, idea. Real briefly, I started it in the spring of 2016. Yeah. And it was ready for me to start querying in, in uh, January 2018. Yeah. And my rule is I give myself a year and about 100 queries. And then I got my contract December, early December, 2020. Yeah. It's almost two years later. So did you have an agent or did you go direct to the publisher for that? I uh, tried the agent route mm -hmm. and then the, zigzaggy again. Yeah. Started with small publishers. Yeah. And so then did both at, at one point, querying both, and then continued that way. So yeah. if I saw an agent that might like it, I would. I would pop one out to the agent. If I saw a small publisher, we'd do that. And yeah. it was a small publisher route that has ended up working for me. And are they local at all? No, they are in France. Oh, wow. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, they, they're British, but they are located in France. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you say that this zigzag route we're talking about into fiction writing, I suppose, has been a journey of um, understanding and learning about yourself as well as learning about the craft of authorship is there anything you wish you knew before you set out that you, yeah. or you'd like to tell yourself now yeah definitely so here is reflecting back on the past because it's been almost a year yeah uh in april it'll be the the year anniversary so reflecting back on that year what i wish i had known is i think this whole journey is really a choose your own adventure, stop yes. a journey. And what I mean by that is in the beginning, once I got the contract, I thought to myself, oh, there are things I have to do. And I sort of, uh, there's mandates and I have to figure this out. And I have to do this, that, and the other. Now I'm realizing, no, that, that's not the case. You can pick and choose what you like, what you're drawn to, and what speaks to you in terms of rolling out the book, and the promotion and the marketing and all those things. Along with that, the other thing I wish I had been more aware of at the time, now I'm aware of it, but I wish I had been aware of the fact that along the path leading to the book being published and then right after the book being published is, there are so many goodies and cookies to collect along the path. It's the connections I've made to people. Yeah. It's the different worlds that have opened up to me. I'm sitting here right now on a podcast yeah. with a man talking about maybe learning how to speak Kandali. <laughs> yeah. That would have never been even something I could imagine in my yeah. wildest dreams. And I, I, I really am so grateful and mindful of that and really trying to keep my appreciation level high because it's just like seriously, whole worlds have opened up for me. Congratulations on uh, an interesting novel, and I'm sure that it's going to be turned into a film. So what's the next thing in the pipeline? What's the next project? Oh. So I have been dabbling in writing short stories, yeah, that's which good. is something I had never experimented with. It's very challenging to me, condensing a, say, three-act work into 4,000 words. I mean, it's, it, it's really pressed me in a good yeah. way. In a good way, I like it. And... I have had one short story published, and I just uh, found out that another dark fiction short story that I've written has been picked up. Oh, good. I'm excited about that. That'll be coming out soon. And then the manuscript I'm actively working on is another gothic -y manuscript, very deep into the editing process. I'm about two-thirds of the way done, I would say. Oh, that's good. So it's, it's, it's pretty grueling, putting my, myself through the paces there, but I'm hoping that that will be the next project out. Oh, that's good. So um, that's a completed uh, novel, but you're doing the editing part yes. of it. Yes. And are you going to write your stories all from the same area so that it, they all kind of 
sit together nicely on a bookshelf, you know? No, not right okay. now. This next one, this current one that I'm working on, yeah. the setting, it's actually, um, the period is is present day time, yeah. but it has historic elements and historic roots. And it is set in a very historic area. I don't know if you're familiar with Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh huh. It's called the Historic Triangle. Yeah. It's where some of the early settlers in America came out. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, a lot, a lot of history there and a lot of ghosty stuff. I bet. Lots of lore, lots of stories. Yeah. So it, it's an area rife with all the kinds of elements we've been talking about today. So I guess to answer your question, I think the books that I hope to stack on the shelf that are published will all be somehow of that vein. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that they'll all be the same publisher then? Because I can picture a publisher wanting to have a set of books, you know, like for example, now you've got your first book out. Mm -hmm. I can imagine a publisher would like to have three books with a similar feel to them. Right. So, um, I don't, once I get this finished, I'll start querying it and, and yeah. see. Oh, right. You're going to go through the whole process what I, what again. I, what I come up with. Yeah. Yeah. Where that zigzaggy wow. path is going to take me. Yeah. Definitely. Well, good luck to you. That's, that's yeah. amazing. Um, so, where should listeners go to then and readers if they want to buy uh, the book? So, it's called The Spinster's Fortune. Who's the publisher? Dark Stroke, a small indie press. Can you just say that again for me? Dark Stroke. So they, they run the span of uh, crime, speculative, horror. Yeah. And in my case, gothic. So where should people go then to buy that book? So I have a website. Mm -hmm. And that would be probably the first place. And my website is, is fairly easy, marykendallauthor.com. And so on my website, I have a bunch of stuff, including the books, of course. Yep. And then I, I keep a blog. I, there's a bunch of interviews that tell a lot more about me. Um, I also have, like I talked about, you know, choose your own adventure. I really love music. Oh, right. So I do a um, Spotify playlist every month. And I yeah. put that in my blog. On the website, I have, all, like I said, I have all the contact information. Mm -hmm. And I'm on all the channels, Twitter. Facebook, Instagram, also on BookBob, also on Goodreads. But I want to say up front, yeah. my love affair is with Instagram. That that really resonates with me. And I, and plus on Instagram, there is a fantastic uh, book community. Yeah, there is. Bookstagrammers, book reviewers, writers. I, I just a warm, wonderful uh, setting over there. That's what I'm drawn to. Instagram. It is Mary dot Kendall dot author, M A R Y dot Kendall, which is two L's at the end. Two L's dot yep. author. Author. Okay, brilliant. That's it. Well, thank you for your time and good luck with everything. Uh, and yep. yeah, let me know if when the next book is due, and then maybe you'd like to come back and chat about that. Absolutely, and, and I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity, Neil. This is my first podcast interview. Oh, okay. And well, it, we, we, in podcast, I was kind to you. You were. Yes, oh, you were kind and gentle, breaking me in. <laughs> and um, this has been a wonderful experience that I wanted to try and get out there. It was definitely one of the things on the Choose Your Own Adventure list that I wanted to try. So really appreciate it and oh, excited that we were able to talk today. Okay. Well, you keep yeah. yourself safe, keep yourself fit, and keep yeah. keep creating. Same to you. Same okay, to you. then. Thank you so much, Neil. Okay, keep then. Bye. Okay, Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay.